Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Natalie Boyum, and I am the president and founder of the Defeating Epilepsy Foundation. We are a 501c3 in Southern California, and our mission is to provide the advocacy and educational resources needed to the epilepsy community in our society. Today, our guests are Dr. Raman Singh and Tasha Fry. Dr. Singh is a recent medical school graduate who is applying for neurology residency in the United States. Dr. Singh completed an eight-week EEG epilepsy course at University Hospital's Cleveland Medical Center after graduation and is now a volunteer epilepsy research associate at Kaleida Health, University of Buffalo since October of 2020. Tasha obtained her bachelor's in neurodiagnostics and sleep sciences from UNC Charlotte and UNC Chapel Hill and is a registered electroencephalographic technologist. Thank you, Dr. Seen and Tasha for joining me today. Thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you. When we often talk about treatment of epilepsy, we often talk about the doctors who are involved in patient care. We do not talk about other professionals who are just as important in making sure patients receive a proper diagnosis and treatment. EEG technicians are just as important making sure tests are conducted properly and can give physicians the information they need. Along with helping doctors, many are involved in research. With advancements being made on artificial intelligence, how EEGs are done, and are changing and opening up more opportunities for people who are in the profession. Dr. Singh, can you give us a little bit about your background and working with technicians in the epilepsy monitoring unit? Um, sure, Natalie. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank you for inviting me again to talk. Um, our talk last time was... Um, it was a nice experience for me, and we pretty much highlighted on pretty much everything in epilepsy, but like bits and pieces. So um, I really like the fact that this time we're going to talk, highlight the role of the technicians, which I believe is extremely important um, in the world of EEG and like epilepsy patients and all. Um, as I've discussed last time, um, I am... So basically, I'm applying for a neurology residency this year. Um, I'll get to know in March whether I'm MASH or not. Um, so before that, I've been working. Um, I've been working on building my experience in neurology. So and I've always found that epilepsy is something really interesting, and it's a core competency that I believe that every neurologist, whether general or like a special, like specialist neurologist, epileptologist, or whatever. I think it's a very core competency. Every neurologist must master. Um, I thought, why not like do things in that? And for that, I've done the EEG epilepsy course at Case Western University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center for eight weeks. And then after that, um, to build on my experience and whatever I've learned from Cleveland Medical Center, um, I've joined the I've joined Kaleida Health, um, the EMU Epilepsy Monitoring Unit, Kaleida Health. And um, I started in October 2020, and my last day was on Feb 10th, 2021. Um, yeah, so pretty much that's what I do. When it comes to working with the technicians, I feel they play a very vital role. Uh, honestly, I did not realize how important um, the role was until I actually worked with them at the EMU. So what I I've done cleaning just the course, learn like EEGs and how to interpret like seizures, symptology, et cetera. But I did not actually work in a unit. Um, so I feel that the technician's role is very, very important. Starting from, from hooking up the patients, like the putting up the wires and everything, all the way through like monitoring all the clips and like um, one of the most important things that the technicians do is that they sort of, you know, the clips are really long when we admit the patients to the epilepsy monitoring unit for three, four, five days. So it's like a minute by minute recording. So it's not really possible for physicians to interpret every single minute. It's gonna take them forever. So what they do is like they do clip the files, um, the, the recordings, and then sort of like point out the main events um, so that it'll be easier for the physician to read and interpret. 
It's one of their like really important um, work. At the same time, I feel like sometimes whenever there are like some flaws in the recording, they will be like the number one people to sort of fix the reading and everything. Like for example, like there's an electrode that has gone like off plate or whatever, or there's something wrong. They're the ones who actually fix everything so that we can get the best reading possible. So yeah, that's in a nutshell my work with the technicians. And I would really, really like to thank everyone at the EMU, um, every single technician who has helped me out throughout my work at the EMU. Yeah. yeah, that is awesome. Now, I met myself from a patient perspective when I was younger. I really didn't understand the amount of work that went into being an EEG technician. It wasn't until uh, really a couple of years ago when I had an EEG for the first time in over 10 years and saw the advancements. I mean, when I was younger, you went to the hospital, they hooked you up and for a couple hours, they would just have me lie there and they encouraged me to fall asleep actually so that they could see if there was any overactivity when I was sleeping. But now when I went and I saw how much went into it, the first one they did, they did um, not just reading, but strobe testing. They had, um, you could see like a checkerboard moving fast. There were so many things that when I was younger, they didn't do. So you could see so much advancements in technology. And even when I had a three day one, I had it at home, which I think really helped um, alleviate a lot of the anxiety so that they could focus on what is going on in my everyday life. It really was pretty amazing to see how much work went into it, the video EEG, everything that um, they have come you know, advance with now in society and in the profession. So it really is quite amazing how much people are required to know in, in this profession. And I think the average patient really doesn't understand it. That's why I'm really happy that we're discussing it today. So Tasha, can you tell everyone a little bit about your work and the importance of people in your profession? Well. Oh, awesome. Um, yes, Natalie, thank you for having me today um, and letting me discuss one of my passions in life, which has been my career for the last 15 years. Um, as a neurophysiology specialist, I get the privilege of working in an EMU um, in Asheville, North Carolina is where I work. Um, you know, our job is, I, I see us as the eyes and the ears for the neurologist. Um, we're not only there for just the patient, but we're there to help the neurologist and, and the epileptologist bring all of those diagnoses to a close. Um, epilepsy is extremely broad and there are many different types of seizures and many different types of disorders that mimic epilepsy and seizure activity. So pinpointing those and not only recording the brain activity during an event, but also recording the, the person's behavior during an event. Um, is vital to the correct diagnosis for the patient. If you treat a patient who has functional um, functional disorder, functional neurology disorder, or pseudo seizures with anti-epileptic drugs, then that's not going to help them, and vice versa. That just doesn't help them. Um, a person needs to be properly medicated for the type of seizure activity that they have in their brain, in order for it to be a successful treatment. Um, so I think that our most important aspects would be, yes, we set up the patient, but that's really the easy part of our job. It really is. It's just, it comes down to, um, we, we do it day in and day out. And it's just something that we're just accustomed to doing and we're trained to do. But the most important things that I think would be like he mentioned, pruning the data for the, the neurologist or the epileptologist. We're taking those samples of 24, 48, 72 hours of data and we're bringing them down to just the hours that matter because a lot of times eight, 10, 15 hours will go by and nothing will happen. But then there's some important aspects of sleep and there's important aspects of during an event and things like that. So documentation is key for us, making sure we're documenting the data. Taking an extremely detailed patient history is important as well. What, what an epileptologist or a neurologist or any physician ask a patient in their limited amount of time with them may not prompt them to answer a question the way that we need it to be answered to give us the information that we need. 
Um, so having several people, not just the physician, but the nurse and the tech all asking series of questions in different forms gives us a, a very detailed patient history. So that's one very important aspect. And I know it's frustrating when a patient comes into an EMU and they're asked the same questions over and over and over, but there is a purpose to that. Um, so printing the data, you know, taking that down from that so many hours for them. A lot of times we'll have monitor tags that are actually, that's their dedicated job. And then sometimes it is the actual, the hookup tech or the lead tech who would have to print that data as well. So it's a team effort. It changes daily. Um, everybody in an epilepsy monitoring unit is involved in each patient's care in one aspect or another. Um, you know, when a patient has an event, a seizure, an episode, or anything that you, the patient or the family deems abnormal, it's important that the tech and the nurse are in the room is, as soon as possible um, to do what we call seizure testing. Um, and seizure testing can give us a lot of details about where the seizure focus would be, what type of seizure it is, and we, we find out, you know, the duration of the seizure. We find out you know, what happened before, during, and after the event, and all of those things. So seizure testing is is vital um, to, to gaining a focus of a seizure and identifying what type of seizure activity the patient is having. Um, like he said, we're, we're responsible for fixing leads. Um, they are a lot of times in an epilepsy monitoring unit, they're glued on. So with a, a little liquid ether based glue, um, but they're, you know, they're, they're not permanent, so they'll come off. Um, we allow the patient to get up and move and do as much of their normal activities as possible. So, yes, we're responsible for fixing leads a lot. Um, and then depending on how many days the patient's on, sometimes the lead, the, the uh, I call it the goop. So the conductive pace that's sitting between the lead and the scalp will just kind of dissipate and just disappear it evaporates it goes away and oh, so we're wow. yeah we're, we're responsible for adding a little more of that to keep that conduction of the brainwave through the skull um we're also the tech support because we live in a world where you know we rely on the internet we rely on equipment and it it's not a it's not a fail safe sometimes our video cameras go down sometimes our equipment goes down sometimes an upgrade's needed and so it's our responsibility to switch out machines switch out leads switch out boxes switch out things so we're front and center for a lot of things um and i think that that just viewing us as an EEG tech who just comes in and does a sweet little quick test is not is not accurate to what we do. When we not only do we you know help in the epilepsy monitoring unit, we also see routine patients throughout the hospital. We do long term monitoring in the ICU setting in the CCU setting. Um, we also are responsible for prepping and helping aiding in the prepping of uh, the neuro neurosurgeons. Um, prepping those patients for brain surgeries, um, finding those focuses and getting them prepped for whatever um, resections they could have on their brain to kind of get rid of that scar tissue. And then we also were in the operating room. We do testing like WADAs, which is a sodium amytal test where we put half of the brain to sleep and see which side is dominant, which side is not. And it lets the, the neurosurgeons know if um, the patient is is a, is a good candidate for an epilepsy resection or a temporal lobe resection or whatever surgery it may be. So I think that we, our importance is, is underestimated, but I think that for the most part, we are all very passionate about our job and we enjoy it. And there are many, many, many facets to what we do. Oh, absolutely. And like I said, myself, even as a patient, didn't realize the um, amount of work and effort it went in to be an EEG technician, a neuro um, specialist. And I think it's really amazing to bring this um, knowledge and information to um, the attention of our supporters, our followers, because I think an another thing that um, a lot of people in your profession have to have is patience, because I know myself, even though I have my three day EEG at home, by the third day, you know, emotionally, mentally, I'm thinking, oh my gosh, are we done yet? Can, would you just take these things off my head, please? So I can't imagine a patient being in the hospital three, four, five days, and let's say something hasn't happened at this point, the level of frustration they're having, 
how do you keep a patient calm and focused and realize, yes, this is frustrating, but you can do it and keeping some sense of um, balance in the environment in, in an EMU. Absolutely. Um, you know, most of us have a degree of some sort or, you know, um, years ago, there were was a lot of on the job training. A lot of us have an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree or both. And there are many avenues we can take in our field and many things that we can specialize in. And so it's amazing. And then you just kind of find your niche and see where you want to be. Mine is the epilepsy monitoring unit. That is where I want to be. That's what I enjoy doing. Um, and yeah, it is, we deal with birth to death and there's, there's no one who is, you know, not going to have a seizure. Um, there's no one that doesn't meet the criteria. Um, it, they come, they, they come with a vengeance whenever they want to, however they want to, to anyone they want to. So, you know, we deal with all personality types and it is a very stressful situation. And anytime that a patient is in the hospital, it is very stressful for them, no matter what, because there are many things that they're concerned about. Oh, absolutely. And I mean, myself, um, being a patient, I can say the one thing that, um, always made me anxious being in the hospital and I think it was just subconsciously the thought of not being in my own bed sleeping in the hospital bed something as simple as that you would think okay what's the big deal just being in a in a to me foreign environment the simplest thing could throw me into a high level of anxiety so it's good that the technicians understand that it's one of the many things that can help um or I should say not help but um cause patients to go into high states of anxiety and depending where the area of brain is affected mine is in the frontal and temporal lobes and my hippocampus has scarring due to um so many seizures i had over the years someone might just start crying and become upset where another person might go into a rage and be ready to be combative with you and how do you know who's going to act in what way so i could see the level of um stress that could be involved with the profession. Definitely. Anyone that yeah. works in the hospital environment has a difficult job on all facets. Oh, absolutely. So I think patients do not realize the amount of training it takes to be able to properly read an EEG and how much research is really done. Tasha, can you explain it to our supporters? Um, as Dr. Singh said, you know, he had to do uh, one of his specialties had to be done in EEG. He has to do a residency um, there, you know, neurologists and neurosurgeons and um, epileptologists, they can specialize in anything they want to. They can specialize in headache or stroke or epilepsy or whatnot. And they have to do, is it Dr. Singh, a two-year fellowship? For epilepsy? Yes. No, it is one year after neurology residency. One year. Okay. So they have to, you know, specialize in that, in that field and just, you know, go through all that additional training to get the education, to understand, you know, not just the, the brain itself, but how epilepsy and seizures and all the other disorders that are surrounded by those affect the brain and the human body. So there's a lot of training that goes into for the neurologists and the epileptologists and the te technologists themselves um, to be properly trained. And, and unfortunately for our field, it does take experience. It takes years of experience to gain that, that ability to actually just watch a, an EEG on the monitor and be able to say, oh, that's this or that's that and be able to just identify at a snap of a finger um, what's going on. And a lot of, it's a, it's a lot of gray. It's a very objective reading and there are guidelines and there are things that have to be, you know, present for it to be called one thing or another. And the seizure testing helps with that as well. So there, it's so multifaceted of, of how many different people are involved in the knowledge base that is required to actually read the EEGs. It's not as simple as, and I don't want to downplay an EKG, but it's not as simple as an EKG. Oh, no, I, I, I can understand that because once I um, became an advocate and really started researching these things, and one thing I love that Dr. Singh has done is over the time showing on um, LinkedIn different brave waves during seizure activity, mm -hmm. and you could tell just from what's going on how different they look. 
and can you know to interpret something like that a uh, focal versus a generalized anything like that it's really interesting i mean myself when i had um seizures in my teen years i would first have an aura i would become very frightened and then lose consciousness and i didn't realize until just this year when i really started um researching about different types of seizures different types of epilepsy that it was called um bilateral tonic clonic i didn't realize i was starting in one seizure and it was transitioning to another seizure mm -hmm. i always just thought of it okay my body's warning me i gotta calm down or i'm gonna lose consciousness and didn't realize i was already in the state of a seizure you know as complex as that eeg itself looks there are many things that have to be taken into account to read that as well all the medications that the patient is on have to be taken into account. It alters the way the brain looks, the state of the patient's mind, whether they're awake, asleep, alert, oriented, those things have an effect on the brain. The developmental age of the brain, whether, you know, what, what age the patient is, every, if, if you take a neonate and put it beside an adult, they're extremely different, extremely different. So you not only have to be able to read the basic brain activity and the basic seizures, but you have to be able to take into account, you know, the age of the patient, the medication of the patient, the history of the patient and things like that. So there's so many um, things that complicate it and make it much more complex to read than just, you know, these are basic, this is what a seizure looks like, because what it looks like in a textbook is not what it looks like ever on, on our screen. Um, we get a few that we call classic textbook brain activity and those, those different waveforms and things. And, and we love those because those we like to mark as teaching because those are very, very simple and straightforward, but you know, there are many that are not straightforward because there are too many other factors contributing to what that brain activity looks like on each and every patient who is different. That is really interesting because I never thought of um, medication playing a role in it. I really never did. I never thought that um, depending on what you're on, how it would affect it. I admit the one thing I know it does affect, and this is from personal experience, one of the biggest frustrations I had when I used to change medication is I felt like I became a new person due to the side effects. And I've joked with um, one of my friends, he's here in Los Angeles. We were talking about our life experience with epilepsy and being on different meds. And I said, I feel like there's been three, four, five, six different Natalie's in this lifetime, depending on the combination. And, you know, we can laugh about it as a, I guess you say a therapeutic way of how we deal with having a neurological disorder. But I never thought that that would contribute to, um, when reading the EEG. Absolutely. Um, some medications make your brain faster. Some make it slower. Um, some make it appear normal when it's actually abnormal because it masks that information. Um, so having, like I said, that, that detailed information, that history, that medication history, when the last time those doses were given and that documentation process is extremely important mm -hmm. for us to help um, epileptologists and neurologists like Dr. Singh do their job properly. That is really, it's really awesome, or at least I find it awesome. I just find it even in this moments of talking, I'm learning so much just talking to the two of you today. And it's, I, I'm, boy, I, I look at uh, EEG technicians and specialists in a whole different way, even though we're just beginning. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. Singh, you did your intensive eight week training at the Cleveland Medical Center. Can you give a description of what your training was like? Yeah, um, so basically my training from a physician point of view. So uh, it was an eight week course at Case Western University Hospitals Cleveland Medical Center. So um, so the first week, obviously, um, as you know, epilepsy and EEG like are really topic, our topics are really neglected in medical school. You don't know much about it. You just hear the word seizure, but you don't really know what are the exact ideologies, how to interpret it or whatever. Only if you really want to do neurology and you're very passionate, something very, very complicated. So um, only a few people would like to do that, honestly. And if you like it, you really, really like it. So that course was for those kind of people, and I was one of them. Um, so the first week, they teach you um, the montages. So um, in every montages, it's pretty much how... 
um, the, the, the leads are connected in the brain to monitor the brainwave activity. So you have different montages um, and montages look different on an EEG page. Like for example, let's say if you want to like uh, compare hemispheres between the like right and left hemispheres, or you just want to, uh, you know, you just want to, you just want to compare this point and this point and this point and that point on the left and the right respectively. There's a different montage for that, and this pretty much makes you look into stuff like asymmetry. Um, so whether there's something off in the on the left side or the right side. Um, you know, and then different sleep structures as well. So the first week, what we did is like just learn basics, um, how to interpret waves. So like if there's an upward deflection, that means one lead is more ne one electrode is more negative than the other. If there's downward deflection, then one is more positive. So basically, that's very specialized, and it pretty much tells us um, where is the discharge focus in the event of like having a sharp wave that is potentially epileptogenic, which might actually end up in a seizure. That's the first thing that we did in the first week. Then the second week was like a little bit more complicated, um, how to interpret a normal awake EEG, because I think knowing the normal is a foundation for learning about the abnormal. So um, the second week was, we used to learn about the normal wave activity in the brain. So uh, pretty much you would wanna know the posterior dominant rhythm, which is some that you see at the back of the like generated in the back of the brain occipital area when your eyes are closed um this is very important because it kind of tells you that everything is pretty much working fine and like simply right um and then apart from that what we also did i remember in that week you know different structures um different you know waveforms and all like things that you could see in the normal EEG, like mu of them and different other things as well. Now, the third week is normal sleep. So sleep is also very important because it looks entirely different from a normal awake EEG. And what you can think is abnormal on an awake EEG might be normal in a sleep EEG. So when the patient is sleeping, yeah, exactly. So like there's like, in general, like you think about slowing, the brain is going slower, the waves are getting higher in amplitude. So you know that the patient's sleeping and it's very important to know different sleep structures um, because a lot of sleep structures can actually look like sharp waves. Um, and these are called vertex waves. They look really sharp. Um, so what you do is to be able to differentiate between the vertex waves and the sharp waves, which look very similar is to change the montage and go to something called the transverse montage in which you get to see that all the all the vertex waves come from the central sort of area in the brain the vertex area um, so then you'll be like okay fine that's normal that's a vertex wave now with time um, after you see a lot of waveforms and you realize that you don't even have to go to that montage um, to realize it, it's like with time you get you get more experience, and then you can easily differentiate between both waveforms. But if in doubt, this is what they taught us. Now, after that comes slightly abnormal EEGs. So it's like you know sharp waves, um, uh, way uh, spikes, um, spike in wave. So pretty much things that we would want to learn that kind of set the foundation to actually interpreting different sorts of seizures. Um, that's in week three, week four. After that, we actually started seeing different types of seizures and how they look in the EEG. Now, there are a lot of seizures that look very, very classical, like the three hertz spike and wave, the famous one, looks really beautiful on the EEG, three hertz spike and wave. But um, it's actually not that beautiful clinically, like the patient just zones out. Um, so it's like very typical for that appearance. Apart from that, generalized spike and wave for, um, you know, how poly spike and wave as well, it's things that you can see in juvenile malchronic epilepsy, primary generalized epilepsy, and there are obviously temporal lobe seizures and a lot of things. Um, and then after that, I think the last two weeks were about pediatric EEG and neonatal EEG. Um, pediatric EEG is a little bit more complex and the normal in pediatric does not 
you know, like normal adult is not the same as normal pediatric. And the pediatric is like when you're younger, it looks different than your older child. Like for example, if you're two, it looks really different than when you're 12 or 14 or whatever. Um, it usually normalizes and it looks like the same after you cross the age of 18 or sometimes even 20 years of age. So, um, and then after the pediatric EGs, we've studied neonatal EGs as well. Now, neonatal, neonatal is really hard. It's, it's like the hardest. Um, and you need like possibly a further eight week course as well to sort of, not eight weeks, like it's actually a one year proper fellowship after doing your epilepsy fellowship as well. Oh, like, wow. Um, because, yeah. So um, it's pretty complicated, but yeah, I can read bits and pieces of that. Um, I can understand the general condition. So this is what we course was able to um, provide me, you know? Yeah. Well, I, I can see how different the um, neonatal versus child versus adult can be because you're having brain development over time. So as you're having brain growth and yes. development, that would play the main contributing factor in it. I'm just asking this out of curiosity. I don't, I don't know if you know, but for a child who is under the age of one where their little brain is so small compared to someone like you and I who's now fully grown, is it just because of the small size, it's harder to pinpoint what exact um, lobe is it, it is coming from? Or, you know, I'm just kind of curious of the, the actual brain. Do you know what I'm what I mean? I think. Are you asking Dr. Singh? Yes, please. Okay. Oh, actually, um, so we sort of. So uh, there's neonatal G and this like normal. Hello. I'm here. Are, Hello? are you? Are, I'm here. Did you? Uh, yeah. Yeah. You freeze. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. So basically, there's like the natal uh, montage, which if you're really small. So once they cross the neonatal age, you normally place the like normal sort of leads, which are more lead than um, than the neonatal one. Now, at the age of one or like probably six months to one year of age, we normally place the salt sort of. Um, setting electrodes um but then there are a lot of factors that come into play it's not harder to interpret it's just different um one of the factors is that the brain being so cold and the skin of the like the head and pretty much everything so um you gotta take those factors into consideration so whatever you might see as lower Amplitude in adultery, it's like less impedance, like the, the, the sort of thinner than the adult. It's like, you know, it's not harder, it's just different. Yeah. No, that, that makes sense. Um, The next question I have, I'm going to actually ask both of you. I'll ask Dr. Singh first and then, then you, Tasha. So I had a three-day EEG at home in 2018. And even though it was in the comfort of my home, I found it, it was very comfortable, uncomfortable still. For patients who have to have a three-day or five-day EEG, what would you suggest to them to help to alleviate some of the anxiety they may feel? And I'll start with you, Dr. Okay. Singh. Sure, Natalie. Um, what I really want to say is that, as we mentioned, we pointed out last time that um, the successful treatment for a patient, epilepsy patient at the EMU, I think, you know, it's a collaborative effort, collective effort of every single um, staff, starting from the EEG technicians, the nurses, the physicians. Um, so, and every, I, I feel that every single, like, person who's contributing to that is has a specific role in alleviating the anxiety of the patient um, who is at the EMU. Um, I feel that for us as a physician, physician point of view, I feel like, first of all, to alleviate the anxiety, we have to sort of explain to the patient that they might be actually having a problem 
but we're definitely going to get to a point where we'll be able to help the patient and treat them. So kind of assure them that in the end, um, we will try and find as many answers as possible to help them out. So this usually well with patients, it's like they sort of confide in you and you explain that in detail to them. Uh, in the event you find something abnormal in the EEG, usually the next day rounds with my attendings, um, we explain to them what is going on, that there's this abnormality, this and that. Uh, we suggest that you stay there, stay here for one more day because you might be expecting a seizure or, and this would give us like even a better answer as to where the seizure is coming from. It's a generalized um sort of epilepsy, and this helps us like sort of take decisions on medications, whether to increase them, use a different medication, reduce the dosing, um, or even, you know, assess the poss possibility of them being surgical candidates if we feel that there's a specific seizure focus. So I think this usually helps the patient from our point of view. Um, apart from that, like checking on them every day on rounds and like, saying comforting words and all their questions, um, whatever questions they have, um, I think that makes them feel more comfortable. I think this is what we're able to do as physicians. Um, I'm pretty sure Tasha, like, you know, in her role, I'm pretty sure she will be able to alleviate the anxiety in some other ways. Um, so yeah, go ahead, Tasha. <laughs> Great. Um, so I think that number one, educating the patient is extremely important, educating them on what to expect. Um, I always tell my patients during the hookup, you know, you may be here for one day or you may be here for six. Um, and just not putting a time limit on that because everyone is different. I'm um, explaining, you know, each and every aspect, you know, what, what's going to happen daily. We're going to come in there. We're going to do what we call activation procedures. Um, we're going to try to elicit an abnormal response from the brain. So we're going to have you stay up. We're going to do a photic strobe light. We're going to, you know, hyperventilate you. We may even exercise you. There, there are things that we'll do to try to elicit that abnormal activity, which in itself will cause some anxiety to the patient to even just hear that, but reassuring them that they're in a controlled environment. They're on, you know, a video. They're, they're safely in a bed that has pads on it. They are, you know, there's typically a family member in the room with them. The nurse is right outside the hall, out in the hall, the CNAs, and everyone's trained for these actual events um, and that those events are being monitored by, by multiple sets of eyes. Um, we have rescue meds available that are already ordered during admission in the event that a patient does have a seizure. Um, you know, just just reassuring them that they are they are in a controlled environment and we do this day in and day out. Everyone is different, but but we know seizure safety protocols, we know you know, how, how to administer the meds. We, we typically have more than one IV site to administer meds because we know that you can't swallow medication. Um, so just kind of explaining the process to them. And then prior to the admission to the EMU, I encourage the patients to, you know, have someone with them, um, a family member, or friend to, to kind of help, uh, help us, you know, pick up on those cues where the patient's about to have an event and so that we can be ramped up and ready for those. Um, and I just encourage the patients, you know, to, br to bring things with them to keep them occupied because not only do the events cause stress, but just being in that setting for up to five or six days can cause a lot of stress. Um, so I encourage people, you know, to bring comfortable clothes and, you know, we've had patients bring even their Xboxes or Playstations before and hook them up to the yeah. TVs, you know, bring their, bring their computers, bring their favorite book, bring a puzzle, bring something they've been putting off for a while, a favorite movie that they want to watch or, you know, plan for it as an event and just plan to be there for a week. Um, I think that the education, like I said, is key. Um, just keeping the patient in the loop and keeping them, you know, aware of all the situations that are happening and why we're doing it. Why are we taking away your medications? Why are we trying to provoke a seizure? And the main goal is to limit uh, readmissions to the hospital for the same thing. So if we can capture those events, capture you know, um, not just capture them, but identify what type of events they are and properly medicate those events, then your likelihood of a readmission are, are taken down a whole lot. 
Oh yeah, and you you pretty much answered a question because if I were to ever go again, I get bored really quickly. And you know, be, I have my husband, but we have children, so I know that having somebody there that wouldn't be possible for me. So I was going to ask, could I bring my computer and talk on Messenger to people or Zoom mm -hmm. with people for peace of mind? And it's nice to know the answer to that is yeah. So I know that. The fact that I would be able to have that resource would help me to uh, stay in a better state of mind and stay more focused on what needs to be done without emotionally or mentally falling apart and causing unnecessary stress for everyone. Absolutely. Yeah. And we can use that anxiety that you have from just the stay itself. We can use that to our advantage because a lot of times the stressors will actually help induce or elicit an abnormal activity or a seizure for a patient. Um, so that's actually, we utilize that to our advantage. It's, it's not fun for the patient, but we try to just make sure that, you know, you, we want you to have as many of the comforts that you would normally have at home with you or the things that would stress you out normally, not only to make you comfortable, but to help us, you know, induce those events so that we can capture them. That's the whole goal of the stay is not to have a normal stay because if you're continuously having these events to capture them is key to a proper diagnosis. Oh, absolutely. Dr. Seen, when we talked last, we were discussing the epilepsy monitor unit in Buffalo, where you help the team caring for patients. For patients who have to have an EEG in the EMU, what can you suggest to patients and families to help them understand the importance of being there to have the test done? Yeah. Um, so usually whenever we have patients admitted to the EMU, they're usually referred by their primary neurologist or like primary care physician. Um, for a suspected seizure disorder. So um, they definitely come to us with already a background of, you know, questionable event that might be a seizure. So based on that, we admit the patient. Um, so basically what we have to explain to the patient that you're here because you have a suspected history with this, which is suspicious for um, epilepsy or you know, probably as, as I mentioned last time, it doesn't have to be epilepsy, it could be different types of seizures as well, psychogenic um, or due to metabolic disturbances as well. Um, and these have sort of different modalities of treatment. Psychogenic has a all, like, it's totally different. An actual electric activity in the brain has a different sort of treatment. So yeah, we have to tell that to the patient, explain it to them that this is what you might be having. So this is one point why um, how we you know how we make them actually realize the importance of being admitted to the EMU. Um, apart from that, um, there are patients who are already diagnosed with epilepsy, um, and they have their medications as well. Um, and uh, you know we're they're admitted so that we can actually assess whether they still need the medication and modification to the dose or whatever. And they're. There are patients who are like usually teenagers, I think by the age of 16 or 17, usually this is where they're really, they want to drive and they've had an underlying diagnosis when they were kids. So it is very important to take this decision of whether we should declare the patient as seizure free so that it'll be safe for them to drive. So we have to make them realize the importance of you know, you cannot drive if you still have some abnormal seizure activity. So what happens is that we wean them off their seizure medications. Like for example, if they're three or four years like seizure free, now it's fine for us to sort of assess whether they are fit for driving. Mm -hmm. So we explain that to them, we're gonna stop your medications. If you still have something suspicious for seizure activity, then you cannot really drive. Um, and if you would be driving, it's gonna be against like the recommendations and we wouldn't be recommending that. So um, I think pretty much that's in short. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I think when it comes to driving, the biggest frustrations um, people have is because it's a state by state um, decision on how many months you can't, can't drive or in what situations you could lose your um, license for a longer time. Mm -hmm. I think that brings a lot of stress to the situation. And sadly, because of... Um, not following something 
I would think states would follow the same protocol, but because they don't, I think depending on the state and the um, health of the patient, that causes them a lot of stress. And unfortunately, instead of um, the DMV dealing with it, people, the two of you have to deal with that stress. And I can't imagine what it's like trying to convince somebody that, yes, we know what you want, but we have to make sure you're capable of doing this for not just your own good, but everyone's own good. And I think that puts a lot of pressure on physicians and technicians that, you know, and I feel in a way they shouldn't have to deal with it, but it's the unfortunate thing. Yeah. It is definitely collateral damage to have an epilepsy or having suspected epilepsy. And I feel like just as clinicians, we have to just be empathetic of those patients and understand that if we put ourselves in their shoes, we would feel the same way. Oh, absolutely. Oh, I, I can say my own personal experience, I think where the frustration comes from is the transport, public transportation systems in so many parts of this country are either inadequate or pretty much non-existent. So to the um, high level dependability on family to um, just go somewhere basic as a doctor's appointment is what causes a lot of the stress. I mean, myself right now where I live, I'm very lucky if something were to happen and I was told you can't drive right now, things like the pharmacy, the grocery store, my basic necessities are within walking distance. So even though it would be frustrating, it wouldn't be the end of the world, I would survive. But when I lived in Buffalo, there were parts of the city where um, not being able to drive was very, very hard. And you were 100% oh, yeah. dependent on somebody. And then especially during times of the year, most of the year we're we're famous for our lake effect snow and winters and all that try so trying to get to get the basics of what you need when even in some areas if we have a real bad storm one year and we end up having a driving ban how do you how do you get your medicine if it's not within walking distance how do you get food and basic necessities if it's not i mean it puts people at a very high risk and i think that's why they get so frustrated with the doctors and wanting to drive, not because they want to do anything to harm anybody, but it just, I think it puts them in a fight or flight state. How am I going to survive if I can't get around and get what I need? Absolutely. I mean, that's why when I saw with um, COVID this year, them um, providing more service to have medication delivered at home or groceries delivered at home. I know some people found that frustrating and inconvenience of why couldn't they go to the store. But for people with my condition, that actually is now quite a blessing to be able to go online and say, okay, I need this, this, and this, and to be able to know someone can bring it to you and you don't have to put yourself or others at risk to go get it. I think it's something that's been very overdue. Absolutely. I agree. Okay. Besides diagnosing epilepsy, Tasha, is there anything else an EEG machine can be used to diagnose? Wow. Yes. Um, lots of things. Uh, not only can we diagnose, you know, actual neurological disorders like epilepsy and seizures, we can, um, we also use our equipment to rule things out and to monitor the activity during different types of um, sedation or testing for, um, for different causes and diseases and pathways and things. Um, a lot of things that we see are, are a lot of reasons that we would, we would get called for an EEG, whether it be a quick routine or whether it be a stat or whether it be a long-term monitoring would be things like a uh, suspected stroke and CT didn't show anything, um, encephalopathic, whether it be metabolic or toxic. Um, we also monitor patients' brain waves through a process that we call hypothermia. If a patient goes into cardiac arrest, we monitor the brain activity while they are being cooled and then rewarmed. Um, so we make sure that that sedation isn't too much for the patient. And then we make sure that the, the things that the body's doing like jerking and shaking and shivering that those are not seizure activity because putting the body into that type of stress and cooling a patient can definitely cause seizure activity, but doesn't always. So we're available to rule a lot of things out. We're available to monitor for a lot of different things. Um, and 
you know, for the epilepsy monitoring unit, we not only, like I said, diagnose or help diagnose the seizure activity, but also the things that mimic seizure activity, like functional neurological disorder or pseudo seizures or um, just anything that are spells or events or jerks or twitches or myoclonus or, you know, right. some, some people have like Parkinson's and they have a non-essential tremor, but they could also have epilepsy with that or seizure activity with that. So we just kind of want to monitor those events and that tremor or whatnot while, you know, determining is it seizure as well, or is it just a uh, collateral damage from the Parkinson's? Um, so there, there are many, many, many reasons we see people birth to death. Like I said before, um, we, we may see neonates for withdrawal symptoms. You know, are they just having basic withdrawal symptoms or is that activity seizure activity? Because again, that stressor of being in withdrawal can cause seizures, but not always. Mm -hmm. So we have to identify which, which one is which. Um, we have a lot of kids that, that we see for what we call absent seizures where they blank out and stare. Um, some kids just blank out and stare <laughs> and yeah. sometimes it is seizure activity and sometimes it's not. Sometimes they are literally daydreaming. Um, there are some sleep disorders that we see patients for, um, on a pediatric level, we see patients for like night terrors and those could be, um, those could mimic some sort of temporal lobe epilepsy or things like that. So there are lots of things that, like I've said, many times can mimic a seizure or appear to be seizure like activity that could be coming from the brain or the body, but they utilize us to kind of determine which way it goes. If it is seizure like activity activity, it comes from the brain. Um, and we're able to see that during an event. That's um, really interesting, because I never thought of something like an EEG being used for PTSD. Myself, I have PTSD. And the thing is, if I have a night terror, I don't remember my nightmare. But I either wake up very frightened or very angry. And I have to calm myself down and remind myself it's okay. It was just even though I remember, don't remember, it was just a dream. But I never thought of um, an EEG being used to see, is it just because of the night terror or did it cause seizure activity? So that's really yeah. interesting. It is. Um, utilizing yeah. EEG as a diagnostic tool is very beneficial for the patient. You know, you don't want to, to medicate or lead someone down the pathway of treatment for a disorder or a disease or something that they do not have because it does not help. It can cause adverse side effects. It can cause all sorts of other problems that are not necessary. When you get to a proper diagnosis for a patient for whatever it may be, then we're better able to properly medicate that and treat that situation and those events or that disease or whatever it may be more properly and give the patient a better quality of life. Oh, absolutely. Um, is there anything else you would like to share with our supporters today? Dr. Sane, I'll start with you first. Um, not really. I think we pretty much highlighted uh, a lot of points um, during our talk today. Um, and we've highlighted the role of the technicians and like how they actually help in, you know, pretty much successfully treating the patient. Um, like they're, they form, they are like an integral part of the whole treating the epilepsy patients at the MU. Uh, for that, um, not really. Yeah. Um, thank you again. Okay, no problem. <laughs> Tasha, is there anything else you would like to share? No, I just would like to continue to thank you for advocating for epilepsy itself. Um, it's There is a lot of healthcare disparity, not just for epilepsy, for but for other things. And it takes passionate people like you to continue to advocate for, you know, people who require disability or require extra assistance or require something that people just don't understand or know a lot about. So we appreciate your advocacy in this matter and even taking the time to, to educate yourself and your, your viewers and your listeners and your followers on, you know, the different aspects of it so that they can, you know, be a little better educated and ask questions. Oh, absolutely. Thank you so much. 
Well, that is all the time we have for today. Again, I want to thank our guests for coming and taking part. To see the great work we are doing, please like our social media pages and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We invite you to visit our website at www.defeatingepilepsy.org to see how we are making a difference for the epilepsy community. Thank you for your support and together we will defeat epilepsy. Take care.